Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jonathan Bellamy. Uh, I'm here with Jennifer Thielen to speak to you today Hello. about international Hello. data transfers and damages in data protection claims. This is a 45 minute webinar uh, and is one of the 39 Essex Chambers series in commercial and public law matters. Today we have approaching 200 participants attending from the UK, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, India and the UAE. And therefore some of you will be able to view this with a cup of tea, others with an early evening drink and some of you with a nightcap. The participants are from solicitors, in-house counsel, in-house data protection managers, insurers and others. Practice areas and business sectors represented include information law, commercial, regulatory, healthcare, sport and entertainment, environmental, transport, human rights <clears throat> and government. The format today will be for two speakers, each of us speaking for about 15 minutes or so, then allowing time for a Q&A session via the chat button at the bottom of your screens, with which I assume you're now familiar. I will speak first on international data transfers, and then Jenny Thielen will follow on damages in data protection claims. You may not be able to respond to all your chat questions during the time available, but we'll do our best. We have received some questions in advance. Subsequent and unanswered questions, we will endeavor to respond to by email. This webinar is being recorded and will be available from Thursday to be viewed via the homepage of our 39 Essex Chambers website. For those of you who need CPD, the website provider is 39 Essex Chambers. So briefly to the speakers, first uh, myself, I have an advisory and representative commercial law practice domestically and internationally in litigation and arbitration. In the information law sector, my clients have ranged from UK and foreign credit card companies, financial institutions, insurance companies, independent professional service providers, including medical professionals and expert witnesses through to charities and other not-for-profit bodies. I also have an active practice as a chartered arbitrator in domestic and international commercial disputes, including in the information law sector. Jenny Thielen is a member of the public and commercial law groups at 39 Essex Chambers. She has a, a growing data protection and immigration rights practice, which now represents a significant and continuing growing part of her practice. So with that introduction, I will turn to uh, my presentation on international data transfers. The first um, principle that I'd like to uh, either remind some of you who are very familiar with this area or uh, inform others who are less familiar is the exclusionary principle. That's set out at GDPR Article 44, and that's set out on the slide in front of you. I've uh, underlined several words on this slide because it seems to me that these are worth focusing on themselves. I'm not going to read out all the words on the slide for obvious reasons, but where, we, where you see there the important phrase that these, it applies to transfers which are undergoing processing or are also intended for processing after transfer to a third country. This is a very wide definition. And essentially, in answering the question, what are interna international data transfers? The answer is, it's transfers of data which fall within the scope of application of GDPR from within the EEA to without the EEA. And what this article provides, entitled as it is, General Principle for Transfers, is, as I say, exclusionary, that in order to be um, permitted, a transfer must, <clears throat> can only take place if, subject to the other provisions of the regulation, the condition laid out in this chapter are complied with by both the controller and the processor. Now, <clears throat> there isn't time today to go into the nuances of 
the further detail of, of uh, Article 44. But what you will see immediately there is that it is necessary to show a ground, to show a, a legal justification for exporting data from the EEA to any other part of the world. Important also to bear in mind the uh, penultimate line there, where it says that all provisions in this chapter, and that by the way is chapter five of the GDPR, shall be applied in order to ensure that the level of protection of natural persons, that's of course data subjects who have the benefit of the GDPR, are guaranteed by this regulation is not undermined. So there we have a, an express repeat or reminder of the importance of protecting uh, the data of subjects in respect of transfers out of the EEA. Now, <clears throat> when considering international data transfers, as indeed with any part of the GDPR, it, it is always important to bear in mind the prominence the data subject uh, rights have been given in EU law. Uh, those familiar with the structure of the GDPR regulation will know that recital one states positively that the uh, protection uh, of data is a fundamental right and refers both to the EU charter and to the charter establishing the European Union. So all these matters have to be viewed against that backcloth and with that context. Uh, the rules are prohibitive and one's got to find exceptions permitting transfer. So <clears throat> there's a hierarchy um, which should be considered when uh, deciding whether and how to export data from the EEA. The first and most obvious route, if it's available to you, is that of an adequacy decision. An adequacy decision is in effect an, an, a, a decision following an assessment by the EU Commission that an importing country has the sort of legal structure, political structure, and also legal provisions which protect the rights of the data subject. There are a small number of countries which uh, fit uh, with that category now. One of the most important um, is the uh, USA, but provided that it is only to a company or entity listed within the privacy shield. It is not a blanket uh, entitlement to export data to the USA per se. One of the important things to consider here is that as per the underlining, is that this is a question for the commission to decide. It's not a question for the exporting entity, and certainly it is not a question for the member state supervising authority here, the ICO. It's for the commission to decide, and it's for the commission to review. And that's written into the GDPR, that that decision must be reviewed every four years to ensure that the adequate level of protection exists. Now, it's in relation to this provision that there have been the well-known Schrems decisions. Uh, the first has come to a conclusion, which dealt a death blow to the safe harbor with the US. And the second, um, we're awaiting the decision on from the highest court, uh, probably in July of this year. I'll turn to that briefly in a few moments. If there is no <clears throat> jurisdiction uh, for adequate protection, the question then, moving down the hierarchy, is whether or not there are appropriate safeguards in place. Now, appropriate safeguards are dealt with over two articles of the GDPR. The first is Article 46, but also Article 47. And these are very important um, provisions which should be studied uh, in detail if one is advising a party on the export of data from the EEA. There's, no, there's only really time to consider a couple here, but I'm going to take the two most important ones for that reason. The first is the so-called BCR, the Binding Corporate Rules. And the second are standard data protection clauses, which have come to be referred to by a slightly different three-letter acronym of SCC, or Standard Contractual Clauses. Now, binding corporate rules 
are a form of intra-group approved regulation. It's a form of approved self-regulation. And what it applies to is the relationship between entities within the same group of companies regarding the export and import of data from members of those companies. Hence the phrase group of undertakings, which I've referred to here. The, the language and text of the article also uses the phrase group of enterprises engaged in an economic activity. And there the, uh, the learning <clears throat> is that this is a route which applies to joint ventures. And one of the arguments which is being run at the moment uh, towards the commission to which they rather pointedly not yet responded is whether when two group entities each have approved binding corporate rules, <clears throat> that should be uh, a green light to enable them to transfer data between them. These corporate rules must be, as they say, binding. And that means legally binding. They're not just protocols, they must have legal effect. And they must specify the categories of data, the purpose of processing, and the identity of the third country. These are typically very detailed agreements which merit <clears throat> careful specialist external legal advice in many circumstances. One of the important aspects of this, which I'll touch on a little later, is that they uh, provide that the uh, exporter shall be liable for the activities of the importer. And that, of course, is important because the exporter will have its seat within the EEA. Moving then to uh, discuss briefly standard contractual clauses. Again, these are clauses which are approved by the Commission. There is provision within the GDPR for clauses to be uh, approved by the supervisory authority of member states, but to date that has not been done. This is a very important route by which data is transported out of the EEA. For that reason, I'm going to touch um, and explore a little bit more depth <clears throat> the uh, standard contractual clauses. Now, these at present um, are set out as an annex to Commission Decision 2010 stroke 87 stroke EU. Now, it will be immediately obvious that this Commission decision significantly predates the introduction of the GDPR in 2018. So this was a format and a route under the previous data protection directive. There is discussion at the moment for revised standard contractual clauses. But the uh, understanding is that the Commission will wait the decision in the Schrems II decision before finalising what is understood to be draft revised standard contractual clauses. You can find these simply by Googling them. <clears throat> They're available publicly, of course, all through the EU Lex site. But essentially, for today's purpose, several uh, points are worth bearing in mind. First, that there is a third party beneficiary clause. <clears throat> that, of course, is necessary because the third party will be the data subject. Second, that the obligations are set out on the data exporter. And they are, to use English legal uh, terminology, non-delegable. So the data exporter cannot derogate from its duties by exporting the data outside the EEA. The clauses provide for obligations on the data importer as well. They're set out at current clause five. And finally, on liability, there is a specific clause at clause six, which provides expressly, as one would expect, for the liability of the data exporter and the data importer. Now, the jurisdiction and governing clauses are important clauses, and they are set out at clauses seven and nine. And in essence, what they provide is that the applicable law and the jurisdiction for breach will be that of the seat of the exporting entity. So if a company exports data from London to, for example, Singapore, then uh, the route will be standard contractual clauses unless it's within company group and the normal route will be binding contractual um, rules. 
uh, and the jurisdiction would be that in the English court and the applicable law would be English law. The next point makes quite clear the IAPP sur uh, survey done recently several years ago now estimates, but it's difficult because there's no requirement to make public these facts, that up to 80 to 90 percent of all international data transfers are made using standard contract clauses. The next two slides I've left within the pack so that those who have a greater interest in this topic wish to follow it up either when they're placed on the website or during uh, further reference will find them. That's all the Schrems 2 decision. I'm going to move over to these two from these two slides now because time simply won't permit it. But this is the current learning from the Advocate General published in December 2019 on the Schrems 2 challenge to the uh, privacy shield, meaning adequate protection or not in the USA. So I'll move now to certain transfers which are expressly stated in the GDPR not to be authorized by the GDPR. <clears throat> and here, this is particularly directed to um, <clears throat> court orders of courts um, which require EU entities to provide data in support of foreign proceedings. The most typical example of this will be US court proceedings with wide ranging disclosure and discovery orders. And this is what is known as a blocking provision <clears throat> in the sector. And here, what, what is provided is that any judgment of a court or tribunal in this sense, um, the, the word tribunal is used um, to mean public courts and tribunals, not arbitral tribunals will only be recognized, a decision to requiring an EU entity to disclose data will only be recognized insofar as it is based on a mutual legal assistance treaty. And this is intended to provide protection for the data of EU-based data subjects, but also to give a defense to EU entities when faced with these requests. And provides in effect, not uh, an, a total defense to the claim, but the uh, provision provides that the requesting entity shall use an international convention and not simply a direct request. And that typically for the US courts is the Hague Evidence Convention. Now, as I've already said, this applies to orders of public courts and tribunals, <clears throat> but not to private law entities, including arbitration tribunals. And this is a developing area of the law, one of great interest to those of us who practice in this area. A transfer may, of course, still be permitted if it is otherwise permitted by Chapter 5, the overall chapter setting out the rules on international data transfers. And that's a point I'll come to now in the closing part of this address, in which I deal with the specific derogations aspect of uh, Chapter 5, which is set out in Article 49. As I've noted at the bottom of this slide, as with many things, the application of this provision to the UK is an uncertain question after Brexit. The current position is that uh, the governments on record are saying the GDPR will remain in force after the transition period expires for Brexit, but the question remains as to whether, and if so, how Article 46 operates. So um, I'll come really in the final sections to um, Article 49. And it's important here not to be uh, carried away by the potential width of Article 49. These are derogations for specific situations. And the best possible example of this is the uh, difficulty uh, in relation to the potential gateway of consent. Now, when one looks at the GDPR Article 49, one might be forgiven for thinking that consent is somehow a trump card. It's not. And what's important to understand is that there is a hierarchy, that one considers whether there's an adequacy decision, one considers if there's not, whether there are appropriate safeguards. 
And then if there's a knock, whether there is for a specific situation uh, permission by virtue of a derogation. Now, there are several I'm going to refer to here briefly. The first <clears throat> is uh, A, whether there's explicit consent from the data subject. Now, this is a high level of informed consent. And when you read on through subparagraph A, you'll see what is required of a data subject. There are a number of practical problems in operating this provision. The first is it may not be possible to identify all or indeed any in some cases of the data subject. So it's impossible to get the consent. The second is that in practice, it may be very difficult indeed to obtain the sort of informed consent which is required by subparagraph A. And the third is that consent is always revocable and that creates a very a significant problem for those relying upon it for business purposes. In B, we have um, a provision uh, permitting uh, transfer in certain situations where it is necessary for the performance of a contract between the data subject and the controller. Now, all I would say on this is that because it's a derogation from a fundamental right, as I mentioned at the beginning of my address, this will be interpreted narrowly, but there it is. There's an important um, potential route. Next, a similar, uh, provision where the chancellor isn't again necessary for a contract concluded in the interest of the data subject, something on which, of course, different minds will differ. And importantly, at the end in E, <clears throat> importantly for lawyers anyway, that it is necessary for the establishment exercise or defense of claims. And the legal claims derogation, as that provision is referred to, is the basis for processing lawfully and exporting data in international arbitrations and international legal disputes. Finally then, <clears throat> just going to sum it up by saying this, that uh, the derogations are a list of safety valves. They will be uh, construed restrictively and they're an exclusive list. The consent has the difficulties which I've already referred to and I repeat on this slide. The legal claims derogation is an important one to understand. It includes arbitration proceedings by virtue of the broad language used in recital 111. It applies also to formal documentary disclosure proceedings in civil dispute litigation. But it's also important to understand that there will be an analysis taken between the link between the data and the issues in the dispute. It's not enough that there may be a dispute, there must be in the words of the Data Protection Board, a close link between the data transfer and the specific procedure. So um, with that uh, summary, I will um, move uh, now to uh, introduce uh, Jenny Thielen, who will pick up the cudgels and speak on data protection claims. Thanks, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Um, so I am going to speak to you on um, uh, data protection damages claims. I, I think I've, I've titled this um, talk um, remedies and that will be the, the focus mostly on quantum um, and it's really I think my interest is, is peaked in this area because of the I certainly seen a large number of, of, of data protection claims primarily low value data protection claims because because that's what they are um, most often uh, come across my desk and I think you're starting to see more and more uh, court gra courts grappling with how you quantify these claims and so we're actually starting to get some case law and some guidance around that we can put our heads around. So the first is the statutory framework. Um, we start with the old framework because that's still what most of the cases grapple with. So it's important to understand both the previous regime under the Data Protection Act 1998 and the new regime under the Data Protection Act 2018. So previously the position was um, the relevant provision was section 13 which provided that an individual who suffers damage by reason of a contravention by a data controller is entitled to compensation and it went on to provide in a separate provision that an individual who suffered distress by reason of a contravention of the act would also, and who also suffered damage, would be entitled to compensation. 
A breach of Section 13, and as well as a breach under the new Data Protection Act, is a statutory tort. And so compensation was by, um, calculated by reference to the damages suffered by a claimant. And for uh, some time, there was a requirement that the damage had to be pecuniary. So even if the claimant suffered distress, there had to be some other element of more tangible damage involved. However, in 2013, the landscape shifted dramatically with the case of Vidal Hell, which held that a claimant's distress could amount to non-material damage and therefore fall within the scope of 13.1. So from this point, individuals could be compensated for damage which was not pecuniary, such as distress resulting from a breach of the Data Protection Act. And that brings us to where we are uh, in 2018, when the GDPR came into force and the Data Protection Act 2018 came along. The relevant provision of the GDPR is Article 82, which provides that a person who has suffered material or non-material damage as a result of the infringement should have the right to receive compensation for the damage suffers. So it continues the regime as it worked under Section 13. That compensation is to come from the data controller, and a processor can, is, can be liable only where it is not complied with the obligations of the GDPR specifically directed at processors or where it has acted outside of the lawful instructions of the controller. Um, so Article 82.3 does provide a defense for both the data pro processor and the controller if they can prove they're not in any way responsible for the event giving rise to the damages. And the relevant provisions of the Data Protection Act are sections 168 and 169, which effectively implement the GDPR. So section 168 gives effect to Article 82, and section 169 provides for the equivalent right for a contravention of a requirement more generously, gen, generally, so processing not covered by the GDPR. The key point to remember is that the right to claim compensation under Article 82, as given effect by Section 168, is materially the same as the old Section 13 right. And as I referenced earlier, most of the case law is under that old regime. Um, before moving on to look at some of that case law, I'll just highlight that Data Protection Act claims in practice tend to come along with um, claims for misuse of private information and breaches of the Human Rights Act, specifically Article 8. So often pleaded cases refer to all three. Um, the expectation is, just at a very general level, as that recovery is, is likely to be the same under each cause of action. Although we're look at one case where it played out differently. So, um, starting with damages claims, we need to think about Lloyd and Google, which was a court of appeal decision, but, and this is the, the caution, cautionary um, warning for everything I'm about to say, permission has been granted in March of this year to appeal to the Supreme Court. So I mentioned earlier that there's been little judicial consideration of the approach to compensation for data protection claims. And this is probably because, my view, the claims are low value and there's been little appetite to bring them. Um, where they're, when they're brought, they're considered in the county court where judgments aren't widely uh, reported or widely accessible. But this is changing for a number of reasons. Um, recent cases have indicated a growing appetite for group action. For example, the Morrison's case I'm going to consider later and in this Lloyd case and um, in the British Airways case, which you may have also heard about. There seems to be a growing interest for solicitors to litigate small value data protection claims, perhaps as they would other small value person personal injury claims. There's also a growing recognition generally that data and control of data is a right. Um, and a right for which a remedy is available when that right is uh, interfered with. So individuals who perhaps suffered in silence previously, feeling that an injustice had been done, but there was really nothing that they could do about it because it felt quite intangible, may feel empowered to challenge data processors and controllers. So the short point is that this is an expanding area of the law. And Lloyd and Google is a key case in terms of the approach to damages claims under the Data Protection Act. And those with a keen interest in the field will have no doubt be well aware with this. But to ensure we're all on the same page, I'm going to spend a bit of time on it. Um, it concerned a representative class action with respect to iPhone users whose internet activity was tracked and sold to advertisers by Google. 
The issue is whether the mere infringement of the claimant's data protection rights and specifically their loss of control of their data um, without a specific at pleaded allegation of, of loss or distress constituted damages under Section 13. This was an old regime case. Um, the High Court had held that the mere loss of value without a specific allegation of distress or pecuniary loss was not damage capable of justifying an award or compensation. The Court of Appeal held that um, data disagreed and held that data has an economic value. So, it, for example, it can be sold to advertisers. And here, Google was able to sell the information it had gathered to advertisers wishing to target individuals. That demonstrated that the information and consent to its use had economic value. It also demonstrated that the individual's control over their data had a value, so that their loss of control must have a value too. And therefore that loss, the next step in the analysis is that that loss represents damage of the kind envisioned by recital 85 for which compensation may be awarded. So section 13 had to be read in that light. The court recognized that privacy was a fundamental human right and that the under the, the comparative tort of um, misuse of private information and infringements of the Data Protection Act were bounded on the same thing, that privacy is to be protected and that it's a cornerstone of the GDPR and that in misuse of private information cases and specifically Galati, one of the phone hacking cases, um, it had established that damages could be awarded as compensation for the loss of control of private, of private information. So drawing those points together, the court recognized damages claim for a loss of control. Um, it was under the old world, but the court also considered the new world, um, and in particular the Data Protection Act and the GDPR, and found that the same analysis would apply. Interestingly, um, nothing, no court has opined on this yet, but by way of benchmarking what the claims were said to be worth in that case, so each instance of loss of control was said to be worth 750 per person. So as I mentioned, that's where we stand now, but an appeal to the Supreme Court is awaited and uh, permission was recently granted. So the decision has serious ramifications for those firms that handle large amounts of consumer data um, in terms of future, future representative actions, but does it also apply to small claims? Um, and what, what does it mean for breaches of the, of, of, of the Data Protection Act? Um, do they all, are they all realistically subject to an award of damages? Um, and it seems to me that's an important question because while these claims are relatively low value, they can still be quite expensive to litigate because they're novel. Um, sometimes the, the people, they involve rather complicated sets, sets of facts, perhaps not around the breach, but around the, the nature of the damage caused to individuals. Um, and so therefore it can lead to expensive litigation. Um, and in the high court case had frankly been quite useful in batting some of these cases back. So what happens to these cases now um, is there a need, can you say, can you make an argument that there's no need, to, that there are cases where there's no need to compensate an individual based on the nature of the breach or the lack of a credible allegation of real distress? And it seems to me the answer to that is yes. And that's because the Court of Appeal expressly recognized the existence of a de minimis threshold, damages only attached to non-trivial infringements. And what the court said was that a claim for damage um, for an accidental one-off data breach that was quick, quickly remedied would fall below this threshold. But of course, going forward, if this case, if this approach is upheld uh, by the Supreme Court, the difficulty lies in identifying this threshold. I mean, a key factor in the Lloyd case was that the form of loss of control was also easily translated into having an economic value because data was being sold to advertisers. So perhaps in a, in a more standard, more case, more trivial um, one-off data protection breach, which doesn't give rise to a readily recognized forms of distress, it will be easier to recognize that we're below the threshold. Um, turning to the uh, case law. Now I've, I've pretty much put up here all the key cases on um, data uh, benchmarking damages calculations. And I can do that because there's still not a lot of them, but they are growing in number. So the last two cases, KD Price and um, ST, actually only happened this year. Um, so the short point, the first short point is that there's no clear judicial guidance, kind of stepping back and saying how we, we're going to award damages. Rather, we have to piece together themes from these cases. And that comes with the usual caveats around how to do that and how not to read too much into the facts of any, of, into the findings of any particular case because 
because all these cases are going to be fact specific and um, assessing quantum in these cases is a very fact specific exercise. But we have to start somewhere and this, these cases are clearly the right place to start. What they do show is a history of relatively modest sums. Um, so I've set them up chrono chronologically. The first is AB and this is a case where damages for distress under the Data Protection Act were awarded of £2,250 in circumstances where the claimant had been seeking data relating to the inquest into the death of his wife and the Ministry of Defense had delayed in complying with its obligations for periods of between 17 months and six years. There wasn't a lot of reasoning, but it was somewhat benchmarked against a first instance award of 5,000, which the Court of Appeal thought was too high. Next, we have the case of um, Halliday, um, where the Court of Appeal awarded 750 for the wrongful processing of his data. And it um, concerned, uh, I mean, the facts kind of, would, just reading through them, probably make anyone feel a bit frustrated for poor Mr. Halliday. Um, it concerned a credit company through which Mr. Halliday had purchased a television set and which failed to correctly record following an earlier judgment that he was not in debt to him. And it went on to affect his credit rating. And it was quite apparent that the situation was a very frustrating one um, where he couldn't get that remedied. And it plainly impacted Mr. Halliday in terms of both his credit rating and the efforts he had to go to to remedy matters. So taking those facts into, into consideration, 750 is probably a bit low now. On the other end of the spectrum is CR. And that was a case where there was very clear evidence of damage as a result of a data breach. Um, CR 19 was a police officer in the Royal Ulster Constabulary and due to his exposure to some serious terrorist incidents, he developed PTSD and a habit of excessive alcohol consumption and he left the force. In 2002, there was a burglary at the police station, apparently uh, carried out on behalf of a terrorist organization and data and records were stolen, including his. A uh, breach of negligence and the DPA was admitted. Um, he sought compensation, claiming that the stress that the data loss incident caused him increased his pre existing problems and had impacted on his life in a number of other ways. He was awarded £20,000 in negligence, but it's no suggestion that an equivalent sum could not have been awarded under the Data Protection Act. Um, and this was someone who there was expert evidence of the stress and the psychological injury he caused as a result of the data protection breach. But then we come to TLT, which is probably the most helpful judgment in terms of assessing uh, compensation for a data protection breach. And I would urge you to start there. It is a, just, a decision of Mr. Justice Mitting. Um, and the breach there concerned the publication of home office uh, spreadsheet of statistics about the family returns process, um, which included sensitive details of individuals who were claiming asylum. The uh, spreadsheet was uploaded and it remained um, on the Home Office website for 14 days until it was noticed and taken down with the details of over 1,500 data subjects. By that time, it had been downloaded by 22 different IP addresses in the UK and one in Somalia. The Home Office admitted a breach of the Data Protection Act as well as, um, a, breach of a, or as, well as a misuse of private information. Um, and the court assessed each claimant. Now, the court undertook a claimant by claimant analysis and did not differentiate between causes of action. TLT and his wife and daughter were from Iran and had been particularly alarmed at the data breach. Um, this was heightened because of a suggestion from a relative in Iran that a family member had been detained and questioned as a result of this publication. They felt they had no choice but to move from the area they'd lived for four years and change their daughter's school and left the community in which they built to become integrated because their address had been disclosed. Um, Mr. Justice Mitting found this fear rational and genuine. The parents were each awarded 12,500 and the child the smaller sum of 2,500. As a child, she was shielded um, from fear by her parents. However, other individuals who the court felt would have had some initial shock and feelings of concern, um, but didn't find that their, what they had stated in their witness statements um, to be the, the, the levels of distress they, they had, did, either didn't accept it as credible or rational. And they were awarded between 3,000 and 6,000. So these different sums reflected the judge's assessment of the claimants as witnesses and of the genuineness and the rationality of the fears they held. Um, and I think this demonstrates that there is both a subjective and an objective element of the assessment of distress that a court will carry out in a data protection damages claim. It's not just about what the witnesses says they feel in terms of distress, but whether that is a rational concern to hold. 
And by now you start to notice that the awards are higher than what the initial, initial cases were. And this partly explained by the very serious context of this particular breach. Um, and it partly also may reflect a trend of increasing damages for data protection claims following uh, increased recognition of the value which attaches to the control of one's personal data. Brown was a police officer, the next case, um, and she went to Barbados with her daughter while on sickness absence without notifying her employer. Disciplinary action was contemplated and the police went on to care gather information about her movements. Um, she brought claims assessing liability under the Data Protection Act in the Article 8. Um, and, and those the liability was conceded and, and the, um, the hearing focused on quantum. Uh, the court found that there was no psychiatric injury and assessed her evidence on the effects of her health to be grossly exaggerated. Nonetheless, the court awarded a quantum for all the claims in terms of the information gathering about her movements um, for £9,000. Woolley and Woolley was a Scottish um, neighbour dispute um, where CCTVs uh, were installed and there was a long running uh, dispute between neighbours. Um, what the court awarded was £10 a day for each of the 912 days the cameras and equipment had been in place. And finally, the Katie Price case. And yes, it is that, it is that Katie Price. <coughs> and this refers to the judgment um, of 13 March 2020 of Mr. Justice Warby between Katie Price and her ex, Alex Reed. It was an assessment of damages for a breach of confidence, misuse of private information, and breach of contract, as well as compensation under the Data Protection Act. And it followed an order made the previous November where the defense was struck out and judgment was entered on the claim for uh, liability only. So this was only a quantum hearing. The facts were that the defendant had disclosed, so Ms. Price had disclosed video and photographs of the claimant engaged in sexual activity um, that had been recorded when the two were a couple and she'd later given undertakings that she would not disclose the material, but she did not comply with those undertakings and had discussed the information and indeed showed it to friends. The court um, accepted, well, the claimant had put down on his claim form that damages would be limited to 25,000 um, pounds. And that was uh, basically to limit the, the, the fee, court fees. Um, the claimant accepted that this limitation continued to apply, even though he said his claim should be valued higher at around £60,000. Um, Mr. Mr. Justice Warby accepted that he was entitled to at least £25,000, but did not believe, um, he kind of uh, poo-pooed the idea that it was anywhere close to £60,000. Um, he did not accept the claims for psychiatric harms, um, noting that almost certainly expert evidence would be required for that. Um, and he held that in making the award um, there was no material difference between the approach to be taken to the claim in confidentiality, misuse of private information, and breach of the Data Protection Act. Um, I should note that th this was all this all occurred without the D's engagement in the case. She had been made bankrupt and hadn't been engaged um, basically since the file uh, since the filing of the defense. The final case is um, a case from April of this year called ST, and it's about a school. And what's interesting about this case is that the claimant was both the claimant, there were two claimants, the mother and the daughter. The school had written a letter about the daughter um, to the other parents of the school. It was a well-intentioned letter meant to be inclusive, but what it did was describe the daughter's uh, special educational needs. Um, she was experiencing behavior problems at the time. The school wanted to explain that it, and how they were managing those so, so as to address concerns raised by parents. When it was ultimately found, the court found that the letter was sent without the mother's consent and therefore it was in breach of the Data Protection Act um, and that applied to the daughter. They, the court also found a breach of Article 8 rights for both uh, mom and daughter and Article 14, as well as a claim for both mom and daughter for misuse of private information. It, it is the one opinion, one judgment that is, analyzes each of those, those distinct causes of action because of the different way they played out as between the mother and daughter. Uh, found that the daughter was entitled to a award of 1,500, um, but it did find that she couldn't have suffered distress under the Data Protection Act because she wasn't aware that her personal information had been shared. Um, Mom was awarded 3,000. So what other factors can, can you take into account other than um, the uh, cases? 
So the first is the Judicial College Guidelines. Now, those are referred to in a number of the cases. It was referenced in TLT and it was referenced in Katie, Katie Price. And that's probably your best bet for benchmarking with what type of award. Um, that, that's the, sorry, the Judicial College Guidelines for general damages and PI cases. Um, Vento, uh, it seems like a likely candidate, but actually in Halliday, Lady Justice Arden was clear that the damages, uh, case law damages for injury to feelings was not a useful point in comparison because discrimination is generally accompanied by a loss of equality of opportunity with far reaching effects and is liable to cause distinct and well known distress to the complainant. Um, you may wish to look at Article 8 claims because they sit often similarly are, are, are rather lower in value um, and there is definitely a strong nexus between an award under the DPA and a breach of Article 8 arising out of the breach of one's privacy. Um, I'm going to, that was the bulk of what I wanted to discuss with you today. I'm going to go through some final points quickly. Um, I will have these slides, as Jonathan mentioned, they will be posted on our website. So don't worry um, about, about noting anything down too quickly. They will be up there. Um, damages claims are brought in the county court or high court. Um, importantly, for the high court, there is now a media and communications list from October 2019, which these claims need to be on. Um, interestingly, if you are faced, if you are pleading a claim or if you are faced with defending a claim, there are some practice directions which set out pleading requirements. And in my experience, often um, they can be, these claims can be pleaded perhaps with a not, not, not a lot of clarity around exactly the nature of the data protection breach. These pleading um, requirements set out in the practice direction um, provide a useful way to go back and, and demand further clarity because they require very specific allegations in terms of what, what information was shared and why it's contended that that's unlawful. Um, Ramona was a relatively recent decision of Mr. Justice Andrew Baker, which basically held um, that the GDPR provisions, which say provide uh, jurisdiction, um, either where the controller or processor has an establishment or where the data subject has his or her habitual residence, mean what they say. So they need, leave no room for a controller to rely upon a jurisdictional agreement to assign exclusive jurisdiction to some other court not identified um, by Article 79. Two cases that deal with human rights and public law claims, you'll see more and more people are beginning to think about data protection and rights and public law claims. And these are two recent cases both of which are first instance at the High Court, but which are on appeal to the Court of Appeal. Bridges concerned automatic facial recognition um, technology being used by police force and open rights concerned the immigration control exemption of the Data Protection Act 2018. Finally, I'll speak briefly on this very important case, um, Morrison's um, about vicarious liability and vicarious liability in the context of data protection. Um, it, it involved a disgruntled employee, and that employee was disgruntled following a verbal warning for minor misconduct. He copied um, from his employer detailed payroll data of all employees onto a USB stick, downloaded it at home, and released it onto the internet through software which sought to disguise his identity and frame another person. He then sent this data to three national newspapers purporting to be a concerned member of the public. The newspapers happily didn't publish the data and they notified Morrison's who immediately took steps to remove it from the internet. Um, the, grunt, the employee was ultimately arrested, but Morrison's was sued by the 10,000 employees affected by the breach. And they brought a claim alleging that they had suffered distress as a result of the employee's online disclosure of their data and that Morrison's was liable in damages for that distress, either directly um, or under the common law of vicarious liability. So both the Court of Appeal and the High Court had found that Morrison's was in fact vicariously liable. But on the 1st of April, the Supreme Court issued its decision and, and unanimously overturned the Court of Appeal, held that Morrison's was not vicariously liable for its employees' actions, but that Mr. Skelton had been acting on a frolic of his own by seemingly seeking revenge um, on Morrison's, and that the disclosure of the data did not form part of Mr. Skelton's functions or field of activities. Um, and the fact that he was acting for purely personal reasons was highly material. Um, so the court did have, so that was obviously a, a massive uh, breathe, employers breathed a sigh of relief. Um, what I did say about the Data Protection Act is that there was nothing in the Data Protection Act which would have excluded liability had Morrison's been vicariously liable, which was something that the courts below had finished with. Um, finally, on Norch Pharmacal Auditors, there's an interesting uh, opinion there on Miracom International. So if you are faced with 
a Norwich Farm Collaborator, which arises, um, which brings up um, data protection obligations. Um, have a look at that case. Again, I'll post this on the website. Um, I am now going to hand back over to Jonathan, and I see we have some questions, and we will deal with those now. Jenny, thank you very much indeed for um, that very full and interesting explanation and uh, run through the cases on damages. We've, we've received a small number of questions, all of which are very interesting. Um, and we're not going to trespass too far onto your time this afternoon, but they are interesting questions uh, and um, we're going to do our best to answer them. I'll start with a couple that are addressed first on data transfers and I'll uh, obviously bring Jenny in to deal with the ones that deal with um, damages claims. Now, the first question asks, um, notes correctly, that standard contractual clauses uh, are documents which take place between controllers and processors and not between processors and processors. And the questioner asks, um, how should they be used where there is a transfer of data between a processor and a sub-processor and the sub-processors out of the EEA? Well, the answer to that is, is they shouldn't be used. Uh, and the reason they shouldn't be used is as follows, that in Article 28 of the GDPR, the definition of processor provides um, that it shall act on the instructions of the controller and provides expressly in Article 28.2 and 3 that the processor should not export the data out of the EA unless it has previously informed the controller of that fact. And so what one would have in that situation or certainly should have to avoid breach of obligation is then an agreement between the controller after being informed and the processor and the sub-processor located out of the EEA. The second question, which is another interesting question, <clears throat> relates to the relationship between uh, what I described as the legal claims derogation, Article 49E, uh, and um, extensive, what the question describes, extensive phishing exercises going on far beyond UK disclosure. Now, I see Jenny smiling because she's far more familiar with US um, domestic uh, disclosure and discovery obligations than I am, although I have some experience of them. But the question's well put because really the answer, the question is what, what's the relationship between um, 49E and um, any defense? And the answer really is in Article 48 because the question is right that taken at um, first reading, the legal claims derogation would potentially include the, dis the resolution of claims in foreign jurisdictions. And it often does, for example, an arbitration seat in Hong Kong or Singapore. But where there's a request by a court body, then Article 48 trumps Article 49E and the court is required to go through the convention route. That's the blocking provision which I described. Now, Jenny, um, one of the questions which has been asked here, we've got uh, two questions here for you, if I may, um, relating to damages claims. The first asks this, um, if the statutory scheme is based on tort principles, sorry, excuse me, if the statutory scheme is based on tort principles, does causation and remoteness apply in the same way? Yes, um, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think it does, although so far we don't have any, um, any real judicial analysis of that point. But I think, um, for example, in TLT, when the court was kind of looking at what I think what I called the subjective and the objective um, in terms of was this a reasonable, a reasonable fear for the individuals to, to hold in terms of, you know, they were, they were saying, we're very distressed by the fact that our spreadsheet has, the spreadsheet with our personal data has been on display for 14 days and there were numerous opportunities for people to download it. Well, the court basically stepped back and took into account effectively the types of issues that arise on a causation and remoteness type of inquiry and saying that, no, I don't accept that your distress really took you as far as you say it did. 
And another, thank you. And another question that's been raised is this, and I'm going to read this out um, directly because it's very much um, within your area. The question's this, are there limitations on closeness of secondary victims that can claim a breach uh, of DPA or under Article 8? For example, in ST, the mother wasn't the data subject directly affected but did recover. What if the father or the grandfather mother had been upset about the breach? So I think in ST, the only victim, use that phrase, under the Data Protection Act was the child. Um, mom got damages for a breach of her Article 8 rights and the court's analysis was focused on her privacy rights being invaded. So in order for mom or, um, or for grandma or an uncle or anyone else to have raised an arguable uh, Article 8 claim, they would have to explain how, how it was and, and make good on a claim that it was their private information being shared, that their right to privacy was being invaded. And that's how Article the, the Human Rights Act element works in terms of shutting down on secondary victims. Thank you, Jenny. Well, that, that concludes the questions um, that we've received. We're very grateful indeed. We promised you 45 minutes. We've run to around 55 minutes. We hope that's all right. Judging by those who've stayed with us, it has been all right. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening and viewing. Um, as we've already said, the uh, video webinar is recorded. It will be on our website probably by Thursday um, and will be capable of being viewed in that way. So thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Thank you.